Good evening and welcome. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Duwamish and Suquamish tribes, who have since time immemorial stewarded the lands and waters of this place we now call Seattle. Please join me in offering gratitude and respect to their elders, past and present, as well as future generations for their stewardship. Thank you all so much for tuning in tonight for the artist talk with multi-genre writer and interdisciplinary artist Anastasia Renee and Winawari co-founder Elisheba Johnson. Um, super excited about this talk tonight. You know, it's been, I think it's one of, there's a lot of programming with Anastasia's show. I think this is one of the big highlight programs, which is hard to say because all the programming has been amazing and you should all tune in for the poetry reading that'll take place on April 24th second to last program. So make sure you catch that, but super excited you're joining us here tonight. Um, Cause I think it's gonna be a really amazing discussion. Um, so tonight Anastasia and Elisheba are gonna be in discussion about the gentrification of the black female body, which is a central theme of Anastasia's exhibition, which is currently on view at the Fry. Don't be absurd, Alice and Parts. Um, as a quick means of introduction for myself, I'm David Strand. I serve as the associate curator at the Fry Art Museum. And I had the great honor of working with Anastasia on realizing her exhibition at the Fry. Um, I would like to remind everybody that the Fry is open to the public right now um, at limited capacity and you can reserve time tickets to come see Anastasia's show. It is March 25th. The exhibition closes on April 25th. You got one month left. I highly encourage you if you're able to and feel comfortable doing so to book a time ticket to come see the exhibition. It is an, Im it is an immersive, multifaceted installation that really benefits from in-person viewing. So I highly encourage you to go on the Fright website and book a time tickets. Um, you can do that. The museum is open Thursday through Sunday. So check it out on the Fry website. Um, and also for those of you who are tuning in beyond Seattle, from elsewhere, or if you don't feel comfortable coming to the museum, which of course is understandable, we're in a global pandemic, um, there are ways to engage with the exhibition online as well. Um, we actually created a 3D tour of the exhibition that you can access on the Fry website. And so you can actually virtually walk through the show, read the poems, take in the videos, look at the different installations that are part of the show. So I also highly encourage you to engage with the exhibition that way. And there's also additional video content um, as well on the Fry website. You can watch the opening reception. But if you haven't caught that, highly encourage you to do. And we'll also be posting more programming um, online too over the course of the show as we enter the final month. So no excuses for not diving deeper with this exhibition, many ways to engage. But of course, if you can see it in person, please do so. Um, I do want to make a quick note that tonight's program has live captioning available. So if you'd like to use this feature, take a moment to locate the closed caption icon in your Zoom application. Um, and there you can access subtitles or a live transcript. So please take advantage of that feature if it would be helpful to you. Um, and also, I love that there's already a lot happening in the chat. That is awesome. Keep it coming. Please share your comments, thoughts, ideas, reactions. Um, you know, obviously this is happening virtually. And so I, you know, I know that I do, and I know Alicia and Anastasia also appreciate a lively chat throughout this whole discussion. Um, and also there'll be opportunities where uh, Alicia Bunn might be pulling in some comments or questions from the chat um, over the course of the discussion. So definitely keep things going in the chat um, and also just keep the love going because um, we always appreciate that too. Um, I also want to acknowledge and mention that tonight's conversation is presented in partnership with Winawari, um, which, those of, which for those of you who may not be familiar is an immersive community art project that reclaims black cultural space and is located in a fifth generation black owned home in Seattle's central district. Um, so their mission is to create a space for black ownership, possibility and belonging through art, historic preservation and connection. By renting a house from a vulnerable black homeowner and giving that space back to the black community, Wanawari is an active model for how black art and culture can combat gentrification and displacement. Um, and I'm reading this from their website, but I think it's important just to reiterate, especially for those of you, again, who might not be familiar with Wanawari, 
building awareness, check it out, go on their website, so much good information. But also, since it ties so directly into tonight's conversation, I also um, want to read this other bit from the website, which is that to understand why Winawari is so important to Black Seattle, one must understand the history of the Central District, a formerly redlined neighborhood that has experienced multiple waves of gentrification and displacement. Once 80% African-American, today the CD is less than 10% Black. There are fewer and fewer places for people to congregate in the commons, the fabric of Black cultural production in the Central District from imagination to presentation is disintegrating. So Bonawari is an active force that's pushing back against gentrification and something that's really exciting is that they've recently announced a capital campaign and part of that campaign is that you can donate and help them raise funds to have a down payment on the Wanawari house. This is really exciting. It's a super tangible, easy thing to do. There's various ways to engage with the program. So I would highly encourage you to learn that campaign through the chat. There should be a link, check it out. I donated already, easy, easy, feels good, check it out. And then after you donate or before you donate, either way, you should also go see the new exhibition that has recently opened. You can make an appointment online. So two shows you have to see, go to Wanawari, go to the Fry. There's no special order, just do both. So highly encourage you to do that. Okay, so before we pull, you know, Elisha and Anastasia in to get into the discussion, um, I'm just gonna briefly introduce both of them. And then we're actually going to play a short video that will give you some more context to the show. But before we get into that, Alicia Ba Johnson is a curator, public artist, and administrator. Johnson, who was a BFA from Corners College of the Arts, was the owner of Fair Gallery Cafe, a multi-use art space that held art exhibitions, music shows, poetry readings, and creative gatherings. For six years, Johnson worked at the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture on capacity building initiatives and racial equity in public art. Johnson is currently a member of the Americans for the Arts Emerging Leaders Network Advisory Council and has won four Americans for the Arts Public Art Year in Review Awards for her work. She currently co-manages Winawari, which I just gave you the whole spiel on. Check it out. Alicia was amazing and we're super happy to have Alicia here with us tonight to be in conversation with Anastasia. Anastasia, meanwhile, working just as hard in as many different lanes as Elisheba. Both of these folks do so much in so many different ways. Um, but Anastasia is an award-winning and widely published writer, playwright, TEDx speaker, podcast host, and artist who lives and works in Seattle. They have received numerous fellowships, awards, grants, residencies. Anastasia was Seattle civic poet from 2017 through 19 was the poet in residence at Hugo House from 2015 through 17. Um, they are the author of five books, including two full length manuscripts, um, V and Forget It, which you can find multiple ways, but also through the Friar Art Museum's gift shop. Check it out, along with some other great black authors and poets that were part of the opening reception. Check it out. Um, and also is the author of two plays, Nine Ounces and Queer Mama Crossroads. Um, that first play, Nine Ounces, actually is where um, kind of serves as partly the genesis for the exhibition here at the Fry Art Museum. Don't be absurd, Allison Parts, because um, part of Nine Ounces focuses on the character of Alice Metropolis, and Alice Metropolis is the focal point of the exhibition at the Fry Art Museum. So how the exhibition is set up, actually, is that you as a visitor are entering Alice's soon to be gentrified home. Alice has the last home on the block in a neighborhood that's rapidly being gentrified. There's a black market that has just moved in next door. And within the exhibition, you kind of enter Alice's consciousness, you enter Alice's mind, Alice's heart, and you really see the effects and kind of interlocking systems of oppression that weigh on Alice on a daily basis. We're talking about racism, medical racism, white supremacy, depression, mental health issues, um, breast cancer, so many different forms and things that are weighing on Alice who is just trying to keep it moving amidst all of these different forms and systems. Um, and you see this through poetry, 
you see it through video, you see it through photographs, you see it through objects. So it's a really holistic presentation. Um, and to give you a better view of that, we're actually gonna play a video tour, um, which was filmed by the wonderful Michael B. Main, who also photographed, um, was responsible for the photographs you see that hang from the ceiling throughout the exhibition. Um, and this clip provides you a window into the show. And it also includes an audio clip um, from the exhibition itself of Alice's insomnia thoughts. Um, so you'll hear that as well. And I do wanna note that it does contain some adult language. Um, so noting that as well. Um, but if we could go ahead and play that video. Stick to the plan, stick to the plan, stick to the plan, Alice. Stick to the plan, stick to the plan. Sleep, 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 sleep. I gotta go to sleep, I gotta go to sleep. I need to go to sleep. Almond milk, butter, eggs, bacon, yogurt. Oh my God, I really need to make more smoothies. I need more smoothie in my life. Kale, sleep, 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 sleep. Stick to the plan, Alice, stick to the plan. What was that? What was that sound? Was that a gunshot? cannot be a gunshot but was it was it though was it a gunshot of course it could be a gunshot what if i die from a gunshot what if the police just bust down the door and shoot me for no fucking reason like pow like boom like splatter stick to the plan alice i gotta go to sleep butter um eggs yogurt i really need to have more smoothies in my life and then and then what if the police say something like they've been following me or i look suspicious did you know that there are so many words for suspicious doubtful unsure dubious shady wary oh i gotta go to sleep i need to go to sleep stick to the plan stick to the plan alice stick to the plan but then maybe if the police come in they'd stop and they'd say something like oh we are so so sorry we have the fucking wrong apartment all together we were actually looking for a different nigger <sighs> okay 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 i gotta go to sleep i gotta go to sleep this stupid insomnia i really need more smoothies in my life kale kale is like the best ingredient i love kale yogurt olive oil yes i need some more olive oil paper towels ice cream Ah, breathe in, breathe out. That's what my therapist says. Therapist is like, just rest and think good thoughts. Um, um, oh, oh, all my friends, my good friends say to me, namaste, namaste. And I feel that way. I think, I think there is a God in me, but I just want to say, nah, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay right here in my apartment because I'm scared as fuck. Somebody's going to kill me. Stick to the plan, Alice. Just stick to the plan. <laughs> stick to the plan. I'm going to stay here and I'm going to sleep. It's going to feel so good. I'm going to wake up tomorrow and feel so rested. I don't want to stay awake. I don't want to stay awake. What was that sound? Oh, my God. Is, is that a gunshot? It can't be a gunshot. It could be a gunshot. Is somebody, uh, somebody is definitely putting finishing touches on the market next to me. My whole neighborhood is now in preparation for a market. There's no more neighbors. I never signed up to live next to a fucking market. Used to be my neighbor. Won't you be my neighbor? Oh my God, I really miss Mr. Rogers. He was so cool. I wish he was my dad. I wish I was a good neighbor. Why can't I stop chewing my nails? Why do people chew their nails? Am I a cannibal? Am I a fucking cannibal? Would a cannibal wake up and just like all of a sudden be a vegetarian? Could this happen? Maybe I should get up and do laundry. There's so much dirty laundry. What was that? Was that a gunshot? What was that sound? It can't be a gunshot. It could be. It could be a gunshot. It could happen to me. Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? Okay, so without further ado, I am gonna turn it over to Elizabeth Johnson and Anastasia Renee. 
Thank you, David. Hi, Anastasia. Hey, hey, can y'all hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? I can, I can. Good, good. Ah. I know that was a lot already, right? Like remembering <laughs> everything that Alice has to say at the beginning. Um, well, I wanted to start by just asking you to kind of center us a little bit more about Alice Metropolis, who she is, and you know, and really, why did you, why did you set the stage of having this black woman being the last person, last black woman on her block? Right, you could have her in any type of living situation or any type of community. So I'm just a little curious um, for you to kind of tease out for us why you made these choices as an artist and what you were trying to convey. First of all, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, you are busy, you are brilliant. Uh, and the fact that you decided to spend some time with me, with us tonight is really important to me. Um, well, I chose Alice specifically because I think that no matter what, even though we've had some some changes in the world, uh, that art wise, I don't think black women, black women anything, black women's anything is focused or showcased enough. So I knew already if I had an opportunity um, to be in a museum that the focal point for my work was gonna be something having to do with black women, um, blackness, black women. Um, and I think in my circles, in my writing and artist career, I have always done black centered work, but it has been predominantly at white centered places. And so often in my work, sometimes, you know, people are like, I don't know. I mean, that's in an all white space. And I've always been saying I'm doing hella black work, even at, at white centered places. <laughs> I'm right. still doing the blackest work ever. If you would just come through, you would see it's black work, and even if it's in a white space. And I wanted to fill the space um, with this. So that's thing one. Thing two, I knew that Alice needed a bigger space you know, Alice has been in my poetry, Alice has been in my plays, but I just always feel like her story, her, her, her full story has never been fleshed out. Even in Nine Ounces, I believe audience members just got a, a piece of her. And so I, I wanted museum goers to get a bigger look inside Alice's life instead of outside facing. Um, in the play, I. I messed a lot with like, what is it, breaking the fourth wall. And so for this museum exhibit, I was like, forget the fourth wall. Let's just have people inside Alice's mind and home. Um, and so that's what I was going for. And I focused specifically on gentrification of neighborhoods because this is not a new subject. I feel like there are just certain buzzwords that all of a sudden become the end thing for people to talk about. And redlining and gentrification has been going on forever. Um, and so it only seemed natural for me that I, since I was talking about systemic things that gentrification and redlining would be one of them. I actually wasn't trying to be in fashion or, um, you know, like timely. I, I, I just wanted to talk about things that were already happening. And I also wanted people to get a deeper sense of what it might look like to have your space or place gentrified. Because a lot of people, you know, drive through a neighborhood and say, oh yeah, I remember when that used to be there. Let's go get a latte, right? It's not very personal. It's still like, oh yeah, oh yeah, you know. And I wanted people to understand what it might be like to, to fully know how personal it is that your space is being taken away from you. All your memories are being taken away from you. You're, you know, the only place you have to ground you in as a sanctuary is being taken away from you. So that's why um, the premise that, you know, Alice is the, is the last person on the block before this, their space, her space gets gentrified was really important to me because I, I, I wanted you to be on the front lines inside thinking, wow, all of these lovely, you know, the Lord's sanctuary 
all of her placement of furniture and objects, it's going to be gone. It'll just be a has-been. It'll just be a memory. Um, so that's why gentrification of the of the neighborhood, actually. And we can talk about the, the other kinds of gentrification later, but that's the original reason why she's the last block on the house and there's a black market right next to her. Right. Yeah, I was speaking a lot about... Um, like I started really kind of like honing in just like as that uh, video was playing, thinking about what makes a healthy community, right? And what does it mean to be part of a community? Um, and and just kind of like really trying to sit in my body about what it would mean to be the only black person left on our block, right? And we all know people who are the last black person on their block in, uh, the, in the central district, right? But I think, um, like I live in the North End, right? And so like I've lived in the South End of Seattle, right? And when like that experience is like um, night and day, right? So living on the South End, I see black people, people of color on a regular basis and you actually feel less marginalized, right? And then living on the North End and there's almost like a cultural shift and I don't see people that look like me, right? And so um, that level of isolation, right? And how that starts playing into your mind about um, your existence, your worthiness, whether you're, you're worthy to be seen. Um, it's interesting, and like growing up in the Northwest too, as a black woman, I've had people say my whole life, like if you lived in another place, you would have had a totally different experience, right? And so being in a place with that growing up where it's 70% white has almost like radicalized me more so than if I probably would have lived somewhere else, constantly looking for places to belong and to, to be. Um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts about that or want to elaborate on your own experience living here and um, and also just seeing the communities change. Yeah, I feel like, well, I think we all feel like our experience is weird. If, if you don't know anybody else that is experiencing it and then when you start to share it, you're like, oh, okay, I'm not weird. There's 5,000 other people who are just as weird, right? But um, for me, I've lived in Washington State for 14 years, but the first seven years I've lived here, or seven and a half, I actually lived in Mocatillo. And I just didn't tell anybody because, you know, you got to work. There was no writing work <laughs> for me in Mocatillo, right? So I taught middle school at Seattle Girls School, and I was a writer, and I would just make the two hour commute every day um, between Mocatillo and Seattle. So I was feeling the the idea of not being seen and being like isolated 1000% um, in Mocotillo. It's not like not being the last black woman for her house to be gentrified, but being the only black women with black children on the block. So being seen in a negative way, it was like either I'm invisible or I'm invisible because it's like, is she about to steal something? What is she doing in our stores? You know, is she visiting? It's like, oh my God, she's driving. Wait a minute. She's driving in somebody's, is she going in someone's house? Oh my God, she has a key. <laughs> Back to doing an Airbnb, right? So it's like, I had to go from that, then driving two hours into Seattle to deal with the Seattle stuff, which is different. So I, I feel like for those seven years, everything was magnified for me. And so this work was building. This, this, this work and the idea of being either seen in a bad way or not seen at all uh, is something that I understand. I, 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 I get it. And I feel you on being like totally radical. Like, you know, I've lived in San Diego. I've lived in, I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. Like. It, it's just, this is a different kind of place. So I, I felt the same way though. And, but, but for me, if I were at home in Kansas City, Kansas City is so segregated that you, are, you can be around black people all the time. You're, you, there's communities, there's just all black people. It's still pretty segregated. So, but, but that's a different feeling than, than feeling unseen or if you're seeing like it's for a negative reason, it, it did make me, I would say more feisty and more like, oh, you're not only am I gonna fight the power, I'm gonna like doubly fight the power, you know what I mean? Or at least try, I'm gonna try. 
And the best way for me to do that, though, is in my work. That's where I'm radicalized. It's in my work. It's not on the street. That's just not my thing. My mind is like on paper or a museum or a stage or a book. So I, I agree with you. I think living here probably raised that vibration of like, hmm. Yeah, and um, while you were talking, I kept thinking about this poem. I can't remember who wrote it. It's only like four lines. And it's like, to be my friend, you have to forget that I'm black, but you also have to never forget that I'm black. <laughs> right, which is kind of goes back to that feeling, right? Like for me to exist fully in the world, I am always going to be a black woman, but I also don't necessarily want to be hyper aware um, right. of my body and, you know, proximity to whiteness or to white supremacy, right? Yeah. Um, so if we, I mean, let's like uh, helicopter in for just a little bit about kind of like, I mean, there's like, to your point, like everybody is got a weird fetish about gentrification, right? And we actually at Wanawari stopped using um, that word and started using displacement because every college student that was writing a paper on gentrification wanted to come and talk to us. And there was nothing about black joy. There was nothing about liberation. It was only about what does it mean for all the people that lost their homes? How sad are they? Da, 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 da. And I think one is something to kind of always think about when we're talking centering like black womanhood is that black women are always solutions orientated. We're always looking at the future. We're not usually like mired in our, um, we're not mired in our oppression, right? We're always looking for like, how we can get our children and our communities out of whatever we're doing um, in whatever small or big ways that we're doing that from, right? But I think like, if you look at red line neighborhoods in particular, to your point, gentrification has been going on in many different forms for a long time. Artist communities are constantly being pushed out of wherever they go, right? Um, but I think it's interesting that like you force a community through laws into a particular neighborhood and then as time shifts, then through economics, you push them out, right? And so I keep thinking about this idea in my own work of migration versus forced migration, right? It'd be different if a whole community of black folks chose to move to Everett or move to Renton and, you know, and create new settlements. But that's not really what happened, right? It was like property taxes and all these other economic pressures push them out. And so I'm just also wanting to know like how some of that psychology has shows up in this in this work and in this exhibition as well, right? The, like the little, the part, cause you keep, you even talk a lot about how Alice is almost gone. She's literally gonna be forced out even though she's holding on. She's holding on. Um, I think that's why for me, the exhibit has the, the, <laughs> the forced red line. Like we know in real life, there's not gonna be, even if, if, even if you're gonna be displaced, your home, there's not a red line on your door, right? I did that in the exhibition because I really want people to have the emotional visual. The starting at the front door, somebody already has dibs on it. Somebody has already decided what is gonna happen with something that is yours. Um, and I just felt very strongly about that. And I, I, I agree with you when you talk about we're always looking for like, well, what's going to happen next? How can we, how can we plan? How can we prevent? How can we plan? How can we get through? How can we rise above? I mean, to me, that is just something that is naturally in us. And Alice, that's naturally in her too. But the, the museum goers or people are catching Alice at a time in her life where she doesn't have any control over it anymore. She doesn't have any control over her sanctuary, over her space, even her body. Um, and the last thing that she has control over is her mind. And even that uh, feels displaced and is being gentrified by racism, sexism, homophobia, worry, stress, depression, uh, medical racism, uh, microaggressions macroaggressions, right? And so I'm talking about that part of gentrification and being displaced too. And what do you do? What do you do when you have nowhere to go? 
um, or what do you do when the options, the options that you have still don't feel like home? And then what is home? What in the world is home if you have to keep it moving and you have to keep going from, from place to place to place? And I didn't want to focus, I didn't want to say what neighborhood, you know, Alice lived in because this is happening everywhere. It's happening in this state. It's happening it's happening everywhere. So I don't, I didn't really want to specify like a neighborhood that, that this is happening in, but we all know, we all know neighborhoods that this is happening in. And even in my time of living in Seattle, even though I was doing the commute and now living here, so many things have changed. My neighborhood right now, I have seen five businesses be in place of where Kingfish used to be. And it's just like, I don't know how to explain it. Every time somebody inhabits the space, I'm like, but it ain't Kingfish. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, yeah. it's just, and then it, it becomes more, it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's less about what's there and if people are gonna eat it. It's more about, again, the memories, the, the nuances. What, where are those people, those regulars that used to come to this space? Oh yeah, we've pushed them out. They're not gonna, they're not gonna be there anymore. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably the most important thing that you're probably touching on about community is probably like the, the memory. There's like a safeness that is the memory that yeah. once those um, landmarks are gone, right, you you're, you feel lost and dislocated, right. Um, and I feel like that's happening all over, right? Like all these businesses are closing that we just take for granted in a way that they'll always be there. Like, you know, that I'll always drive by Boracini's, right? Like, which is just the, the last week, right? Or, um, and you know, I, I don't think I've ever bought a cake at Boracini's. I've had many Boracini's cakes, but there's something about feeling like that's part of being part of Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, to seeing all the buildings go up all over town, in particular South of Lake Union, and it literally changes our landscape. Or when I'm on First Hill, when I turn on to, um, I think it's John, but I, I get confused sometimes because there's all these new buildings where for 20 years I used to drive, I'm driving on the same street, it's not the same. Um, so I do think there's something about memory that whether or not you actually want to go to that festival anymore or want to frequent that business anymore, there's something that it holds for you that is a, the collective consciousness about safety um, and what that neighborhood represents. Yeah. I think too, that translates for me, you know, the memory and the changed landscape with people. Um, when the people around you or the communities around you, when people are dying or not feeling well, is for me, it's the same. It's the parallel. It's like, should I turn right or left? I don't, this doesn't look familiar anymore, right? And it's like, oh, such and such doesn't live here anymore. I don't, oh, or they, more bad news about somebody else. They've passed. Oh, I think the, the, the like, the, there's an energetic and a a human side to the gentrification and the misshapen landmarks. I, I think it it happens inside the heart when we talk about bodies, bodies and human life, especially black life too, and black women, right? You know, we we are each other's archivists. We are the ones, we're the pioneers, we're the archivists, we're the journalists. We are the ones, we are the ones. And so as we are leaving and moving and unintentionally migrating <laughs> or being pushed out or killed, we don't get to finish our stories. We don't get to finish our landscape. We don't get to, we don't get to be the benchmark anymore. And I think that's, that's what Alice is feeling. Like, who, who am I again? Where am I? Who is supposed to support me? Who's gonna write about me? Who's gonna tell my story? Who's gonna be in this house? Uh, it's just, it becomes one big question, one big question mark. I totally agree. 
I want to go back to my question about what does it mean to be in community? What makes a community? And the reason I'm asking that is because I know Black folks who either grew up in Seattle and moved away and came back or who moved here, like you said, who are trying to find that community, right? And for many, many decades, people said, we'll go to the central district, right? Which is not necessary. You can still actually do that. Um, I think there is a renaissance happening right now that's very exciting. Um, and it's a multicultural neighborhood. So I think people can still get grounded there. But I, I'm, I do think from, for people like Alice and for like us and others, like you kind of touched a little bit on that, right? Like it's the people who are gonna write about you. It's the, I saw in the chat, it's a, um, I think it was either Kata Kumari said, it's the people that you know, it's a place where you know people will say hi to you, acknowledge you, right? You go to small communities, people know your name. I'm kind of like wonder, wondering what are the building blocks of a community, right? So when, you're, when that's fractured, how do you actually go to the next place and rebuild? Mm. Right, um, which I think hasn't necessarily happened. One because one, I think the central district still holds as kind of like a um, a central place for people to come back to. Right, even even in the last fifteen years, people still would come back for church and stuff like that, or you know, Umoja Fest or whatever. Even though some of that stuff has been strained in the last fifteen years, but you know, what are those building blocks that you would take with you to rebuild a new community? Uh, that's such a hard question for me because I'm just a, inside, I'm just a big old teddy bear. I think I wish community was just that easy. Um, I have to be honest and say, you know, part of systemic racism is, of course, making BIPOCs, people of color, and Black people not be in community. Right, that's the bigger plan. If you put them all in little pockets and spaces and clicks and crews and squads and intentionally make it so they're not talking to each other, then there cannot be come unity. So I think one of the biggest things um, that makes a good community is when we are all, no matter where you are, we are all loving on each other and bringing each other together instead of like, I live here and I live here. Um, it's more like we all live here. I live here, you live there, but we all live here. And these are the things that are going on to all of us. So I think that part of having a community is real community. Like it doesn't matter, you know, if I moved here from somewhere else or if I've been here for 20 years or like if I'm an Aquarius or, you know, <laughs> how old I am or if I'm vegan or, you know, if I eat fried chicken every night, you know, like if, I, if I'm if i going to the ocean for Yemeya and you're going to church on Sunday, it shouldn't matter. Like a true community, we are loving, respecting and joining together. I think that that's, that is what I think is a, is a good community. Cause again, when we're apart, we, we are, we're not helping we're not helping um, with bigger situations. So when I think of a community, I think of, again, wherever I am, somebody's speaking to me and I'm speaking to them. Like, um, it's all love, even if it's not deep love. You don't gotta know my life story, but we can hold a conversation. You know what I mean? Or not hold a conversation, right? Well, and just, you just sit in silence. And, and look, yeah, to me, that's, that's what community is. I just sit here and you just sit here and we're just like this. And then we're like, okay, bye, that's really all I needed. And you're like, okay, see you see you next Thursday where we sit here in silence and stare. You know? You know, a community a, a community is like, how are you doing? And while I'm telling you, you're not walking away. You're you're staying to find out how I'm doing. Cause I'm cause you asked me, so I wanna tell you how I'm doing. You know? I yeah. think it's just very basic things that make a community. A community is not like, have you talked to such and such? No, they didn't call me, so I'm not calling them. You know, it's, shouldn't, it's no games. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a checkerboard, it's not a chess. It's like community. It's, it's love. And I think it's also recognizing that we all deal with the struggle um, in different ways. We don't all have to be picketing. We don't all have to be writing poems. We don't all have to be, we, we each have our own strengths. 
And I think a community just celebrates each other's strengths instead of picking out what the, what each other's challenges are. I mean, I don't, um, I, I think, I think it's important to critique and to, to talk about challenge, but I think before you can critique and talk about challenges, you should acknowledge and be in love, which I, that's what I said. It probably sounds really like, you know, first day of kindergarten, but that's, those are some of the components that I think a community has. It makes me feel so good if I'm walking down the street and somebody's like, hey, hey, and I'm like, hey, you never know. You can make somebody's entire week just by acknowledging that they're on the block. You know what I mean? I, so I think s small things. I leave it to all my my sisters and brothers out there who can who can dice out all the all the heady things about you know a community structure and all that. Y'all do that. But my thing is, I want to love on you. I want to say hi. I don't know. I want to know how you're doing. You know what I mean? I want to send you a text and be like, you all right? I'm thinking about you. What do you need? I think some of those basic things make um communities and i also i also think that again we can't be each other's enemy i don't need to get something from you that i already get from people who don't have my best interest at heart do you know what i'm saying i don't want to be in the outside world and then come to my inside world of my folks and my community and have to deal with the same same situations yeah. And I wasn't trying to quiz you. I was really trying to figure out like if we were going to make a recipe for a community. I think we should. Yeah, yeah. You got the base, you got the brew, which is I love. Have brew, yeah. <laughs> I have brew, you know, which is just love and basic. Do you see me? And I see you, you know? And then other people can come up with all the other, you know, important things. But I think that's what's going on with Alice. She doesn't have that. She doesn't have the rules. She doesn't have, she doesn't feel seen or heard or held or loved just when she needs it the most. Um, and that's partially her fault too, because she has too much keep it moving and pride to maybe reach out to the people who would, who would be, who would be her community, but she doesn't have that. And she's also not gravitating towards them to, to receive that. Yeah, one of my good friends um, studied abroad in Senegal, and I use this example a lot, just because like being completely Western, like it was very clear to me that I didn't understand this level of community. But she went back, so she studied abroad and then she went back to live for a couple of years. And she was like, all I need is my suitcase. And I was like, but you need money for food. And she was like, no, I don't need money for food. People are gonna feed me. And I was like, but you can't expect people to feed you. And she was like, no, 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 you don't get it. Like you don't, like, and I, and I, and it took me months to actually understand that like, there are communities in the world, right? So she was like, no, I know that when I go to Dakar, somebody's gonna be like, come in the house, we're gonna feed you, you know what I mean? And, and like, I have all this stuff wrapped up in white supremacy, but like, well, you can't take people's stuff you don't know for free, or you gotta give something back in return. Like, you know what I mean? Like that level of receiving is so foreign to me. <laughs> but I think that that, like, that is where we could kind of start, right? That you would never have to worry about feeding yourself, being homeless, that your kids are safe, that there's a village around you that is protecting you and kind of creating those um, guardrails, the frameworks, right? So that you don't feel like you're gonna be lost, right? Capitalism by definition says that, you know, whatever Mark said, 10% or 8% or whatever, it's gonna be home, like poor or homeless, right? So we're constantly actually, it pits us against each other. And I was talking to some folks on, in a community meeting a couple of years ago, and it wasn't, it wasn't black folks, but they were talking about the loss of like how all the new buildings, you drive in the back and then you go in your house from like the garage. And so you never say hi to your never neighbor. say hi, yeah. And this woman just broke down into tears. She lived in Greenwood, but just talked about how she missed saying hi to her neighbors. And I thought we're actually all collective grieving what's happening to our city, <laughs> right? Like, and I think there's this false, you know, idea that like white folks are um, enjoying this kind of loss of community, um, but we're all suffering in a way, right? We all need neighbors. We all need uh, somebody to borrow a cup of sugar 
or you know, let us know if we left our lights on in our car <laughs> so we don't need to jump it later. You know what I mean? There's all these things that we actually all realize that we need. And COVID-19, if anything else, has taught us that our health is, is interconnected. So if our health is in, interconnected, everything else is interconnected as well. I think that's why Alice, you know, in her rant is like, won't you be my neighbor? Like, ah, I remember neighbors. Now the black market is my neighbor. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. Um, I, I, I think it's hard too when we're living our lives, we don't necessarily have time to say, okay, now what do I need in the community? <laughs> it's just operating. We're just moving and grooving, keeping it moving, pushing it forward, you know? I don't really think, I was speaking for myself, I, you know, I don't just take, take inventory and say, what do I need? I just operate within the system I feel that I'm in. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest and say, I actually don't wanna tell people what I need. I, and I know that sounds really childish, but like, I feel like people will say that to me, like, tell me what you tell me what to do. And I feel like that's not how I show up for people, which again goes back to like community, right? If somebody has a baby, I'm gonna make you some food. If you are sick, I'm gonna figure check in on you. You know what I mean? Like, and yeah. I feel like I'm already caring enough as a black woman that I also don't need to make a list on how I need to be cared for. Right, you need to I'd actually like somebody to just come and care for me. <laughs> so hard it's so hard right because i'll say i i but i'm one of those people i'm like what do you need because for me i can think of 20 things that you might need and you know i don't want to be crushed I, you know what i mean like i thought you needed a bouquet of flowers it turns out you're allergic <laughs> oh my god you know i want to cook for you it turns out you're a vegan i just made you smother chicken i'm sorry you know like so I, I, I feel like I fall into that category too of wanting to give and wanting to, to, to go back to a time that I, I grew up in or a place, but everything just feels so different now that I, I too have become one of those, well, what do you need? But that's not my nature. My nature is just to give you, give you, give you what I think you need. But then if you don't need it, then it's like, I don't know. I don't know. And then I think that's why we need to go back to revisiting what, you know, this should be an ongoing question. What is the recipe for community? Because then also it's just like you let people give you things and you take them, <laughs> even if you don't, because you're just, you're just like, you appreciate it. You know, you're like, well, I have all this mother chicken and I'm a vegetarian, but I'm so grateful for it. Now, who else do I know in the community who could do this? But this is, I, I guess, that's what I was trying to show in the exhibit, even in the way that we're talking now, and we're able to laugh and bounce ideas upon. If the museum goers can imagine, Alice doesn't have that. She just has I to highlight a couple of the thoughts in the chat. Yeah. Um, Librec, I hope it's okay, I'm shouting you out. You said the, the inability to receive from someone because that's conditioned belief that the person offering wants something from you, which may not be the case, but it's so hard to unpack internally. That is so true, right? And I think that like again, capitalism and white supremacy tells us that they do want something from us. And so we actually have to deprogram that out of ourselves. Um, Kamari, hey, um, said that this um, has her thinking about the ways displacement and separation limit how we can be in community. It feels like we wind up adapting to a way of being that is not natural for us and further chips away. Yes, I totally agree. Um, yes, and Kamisha brought in, we're groomed to be suspicious of one another and that we need to be independent at all times. And I did write that note, Kamisha, um, that whiteness encourages um, us to be solitary, right? Um, it's all about individualism, right? Um, and all these things that if you can't do it yourself, then there's something wrong with you, right? You're failing. Um, and so I agree with all of that. You're not good enough. You're definitely not good enough. Yeah. yeah. There's all of that. I'm just sitting, I'm sitting with the, I'm sitting with the comments and I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so much good stuff. Um, I'm just looking at my notes. Trying to be good conversationalist. You are a good conversationist. We talked about this. This is just like it's when you're into it. Anastasia, it's a lot. Um, 
Talk a little bit about Alice having cancer. Why was that important? I think it was important for me to talk about Alice having cancer because it goes back. Uh, I deal with it in nine ounces. Um, uh, in my hometown and in my family and people that I know personally, like cancer is a thing. It's a thing. And I, but I don't, I don't feel like in black communities you are allowed to, to talk about it sometimes or to even go through what you need to go through. Um, if you're a black woman and you talk about having cancer, for all you know, you may not work again. No one may want to hire you again. And they're like, oh no, you might be sick. You can't, well, I don't know about that. Um, and then I wanted to talk about medical racism because we all know white women actually get breast cancer more, but black women die from breast cancer. And that is because many doctors are like, you're fine. How about we just come back annually? We'll just do the, you know, the mammogram in a year. That lump is probably fine. And then time goes by and then you have phase two or phase three cancer. Um, and I also think there's a level of classism and ageism as it relates to cancer and black women. And so I wanted to talk about the, the, actual, the actual cancer, right? That takes over a, a woman's body that she has no control over sometimes. And then I wanted to talk about the cancer of stress and worry and fatigue that happens um, that causes sometimes physical masses or dis-ease, right? Like this lump is not just cancer. This lump is how are you gonna pay your rent? This lump is you just lost a relative that died. This lump is you're trying to go to school full time and be a parent full time and be a caregiver full time. This lump is because you're so sad. So I, I was trying to talk about two different kinds of cancers that I feel are taking black women out. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that you know black women are the only people that this is happening to, but this is what I'm focusing on. This is what this is Alice's particular story that not only is she dealing with losing her home but she is battling cancer and she's kind of in denial of it she knows exactly um that it's happening and that it's taking over her but there's a piece of her that's in total denial you know just keep it going keep it moving do all my regular stuff and maybe i'll wake up and zam it'll be gone away um and i was trying to show that within the guides of art and text what it might look like to have to fight all those battles all at once and still look good, you know, cause you gotta look good as a black woman. You're being judged all the time on your appearance, on your clothes, you know, on, on all the materialistic things too. And I wanted to show what it looks like when you're struggling with all of that and still trying to be sane um, and trying to be healthy, you know, have your kale and do your yoga and drink water and think positive thoughts and have a therapist while you have cancer and the police might kill you and <laughs> you're lonely. And so I thought that Alice's battle with, with cancer was important. And I also thought it was important to show the black breast. Uh, how many times do you go somewhere and see a black breast on the wall um, without it being connected to sex? And I, I thought there could be power in deliberately and intentionally showing the black breast from the from the black woman, Alice's boob, um, to the world. So that's why I chose the talking about can cancer in all those ways. Well, in in some ways, right? Like because it's you know a disease that affects so many different people, it's probably a way that other people can be tapped into kind of like, oh, and she's also dealing with that, right? And all the myriad of things that comes from somebody fighting cancer. Um, and, the, and there's a level of loneliness and isolation too from that, right? So she's dealing with loneliness and isolation from many different levels. Um, and that is the end of that thought. <laughs> I don't have anything else to say about that. But <laughs> but that no, it's okay. That was a, that's a lot. It's a lot. But you bring in, um, 
there's an opportunity for us to pray and honor our Lord. And our Lord is not a Christian Lord, but Audrey Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about the power of her and why she um, is so present also as well in this exhibition? Yeah, you know, Alice and I have that in common. Um, I also wanted to go back really quick. Someone asked, why did I focus on cancer being physical and not mental? And I was, I was focusing on both. I think that there's the cancer of stress. There's the cancer, the cancer of isolation. Uh, there's the cancer of loneliness and depression. There's the cancer of anxiety that's also eating away at Alice. So I was trying to actually show both the physical cancer and the emotional and mental cancer, which causes disease. Um, but um, Alice loves Audrey Lord, and I think in Alice's mind, she thought, "Oh wow, Audrey Lord survived cancer. She did." a number of years surviving cancer. And Audre Lorde was so strong and beautiful, but also vulnerable. And Audre Lorde was a lesbian and Audre Lorde traveled, right? So for Alice, Audre Lorde truly became the Lord. Like Audre, you know, in the way that some people open their Bibles for a scripture for Alice, it's sitting, throwing all those, all the Audrey Lord books around her and just opening one and choosing a page, page 135. Okay, this is what Audrey Lord is saying to me. So I really wanted to, to create the vibe. That's why there's a, you know, uh, 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 I don't wanna call it a shrine, but there's a, there's a sanctuary in Alice's house that is just devoted to Audrey Lord because It truly is the place where Alice goes to heal. It's the place she goes to feel heard. Um, It's the place she goes to get, it's her sacred text. Audre Lorde's poems and essays and voice for Alice, it's Alice's sacred text. I also chose it as Anastasia because as a teacher, adult teaching adults uh, and college students, uh, in high school, there are still people that have no idea who Audre Lorde is, and it just bugs me. <laughs> it bugs me. And I'm like, what? You want me to see if Audre Lorde can come to our class and be a speaker? Are you kidding me? <laughs> right? I wish she could come be a speaker too. So I think there was just a level of like, let me open up the community to some people who may not know about Audre Lorde and then hopefully that'll take you to Lucille Clifton and then maybe that'll get you hip to Gwendolyn Brooks and then like you'll you will go on this path um because I couldn't I couldn't show all those people so for me Audre Lorde was like a way in a way in to help those folks yes I think we all kind of create those people as as uh, people of color, right? Like, um, and you have Nina Simone in the exhibition mm-hmm. who from the, when I first heard her music, it was, it felt to me for the first time there was another black woman in the world that completely understood who I was. Yes, Nina Simone is all through nine ounces for the same reason. <laughs> and I think we need that, right? Like, so somebody else might be like, who is that? But I'm like, I realize that we all need to feel like we're not alone in whatever like intersections of our identity are and that there's somebody out there that can um, understands what wholeness feels like for us. I didn't want to lose um, a comment. Uh, I thought that Bettina made a very great comment. Um, there's something about health and illness too that again conjures up issues around isolation and individualism. One has to really remember that they need to be cared for. What a scary thought when isolated. And I think that's true, right? Like yeah. I think we're all looking to make sure um, it's like the thing I can't do, the trust fall. I totally can't do this. Uh, <laughs> but right, like, <laughs> I, I obviously, I you, you see, you see, I'm, I'm like, fall. I got you. I'll put my back into it. I promise I got, and I will. But then they'll be like, okay, Anastasia, you do it. I'm like, it's okay. I don't need to do it. Right. <laughs> I don't need to do a trust fall. We've already done it. You can fall again, you know? And I think that's what I'm talking about. And that's part of Alice's problem. She's never, Alice would never do a trust fall. Never. In her mind, you don't, I'm not going to be vulnerable 
I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you see me fall. For me, it's more just trusting you're actually going to get me. <laughs> you don't sneeze. You don't look the other way, <laughs> which is the other thing, right? Um, yeah. Means, there's a lot of trust that means that like somebody's going to pick up the slack when you, um, when you don't have it. And yeah. that's a special type of release. Yes. Can you hold my weight? Can yeah. you? Can you hold all my weights? Can you hold my weight? Can oh, there's a Rita Dove shout out. I love Rita Dove. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna give the floor back to you. Oh, on this yeah, I told okay. you, I'm not good. Everyone, anyone who knows me personally, you know I cannot do this and look at chats because then all I do is look at chats and then I'm not looking here. Then I'm a bad guest person. So it's like, I can't look at the chats because I'll just be like, hmm. Um, but I'm so glad that people are talking and y'all are feeling our conversation. Um, so but great. You did not really touch on fully before we probably leave people for the evening. I want you to talk a little bit more about, we talked about gentrification of communities and space, but we gotta get to the body, right? Yes. And we know what it's like for Alice's physical body to be isolated in this community and that she's also fighting cancer, which also intersects with medical racism. But what we, me and you were talking a couple of weeks ago about also just like, um, there's ways that our bodies are displaced in the same way the land is. And if you'd like to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, see for me, that's, it's like gentrification and appropriation. Uh, gentrification, I guess, is what I'm, I'm talking about, you know, there are people in the world who would love to have black lips and black hips and black booty and black hair, but they don't really want to live the life of a black woman. Um, and so I'm talking about like how people love the aesthetic, the essence, the nuance of black womanhood, while at the same time they disrespect black women, right? If someone sings, you know, this, oh, that's a soulful voice. But if a black woman is singing regular, she's all right. That's just, it's just regular, right? And so I was trying to, as the artist, show what happens when pieces of our bodies have been farmed out energetically, um, when it's in our lineage and it's in our DNA. By the time it gets to Alice, her voice has already been farmed out. Her body has already been dissected and farmed out. Her body is already on sale. It's it's already up for auction. Um, and so she's depleted. It looks like she is a whole person, but pieces of her body have already been taken um, by the time it, it gets to her. So I'm talking about literally energy, people, and systemic history taking over black women's bodies. And of course, using us for experiments, we're not even gonna talk about that, the, the medical racism and the, the medical appropriation of black women's bodies. And I guess in theory, what I'm saying as an artist and a writer, as an archivist, is like all that energy just doesn't leave. You don't just get born as a black woman and then you have a clean slate. Um, and so I feel like energetically and historically, Alice is holding again the weight of, of all of that, holding the weight and always trying to combat that, right? We're always trying to get our voices back. We're, all, we're, we're trying to get our wombs back. We're trying to get our bodies back. Um, instead of coming intact, you're, I feel like constantly grabbing at, 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 at trying to be a whole person. Um, and the gentrification of bodies for me is just that. You are trying to constantly take something from me and I'm trying constantly to get what you took from me while I'm trying to figure out what me is and be a whole and better me, which could feel like a bunch of shattered and broken pieces. Um, and, and so Alice, is being gentrified over and over and over in all these ways. She's steadily trying to pick up the pieces. She's trying to pick up the pieces of herself um, that have been farmed out, auctioned, closed. Um, whether you can actually see it or not, she 
feels all of those things. Yeah, um, I was thinking about like a lot of what gentrification has to do with is resources, right? So in the communities before um, they were desirable, right? People felt like they didn't have any resources or they were deprived of resources. And then folks go in when it's desirable, um, either bring resources or extract the resources that were already there, right? And I think that's been happening to black women on this continent since slavery, right? From yeah. you, you think about the fact that we couldn't nurse our own children, but we had to nurse other people's children. Um, and just like the space we had to like duly hold in terms of taking care of other people, not willfully against our will, but then taking, still going back and taking care of our families and holding space for all of that without yeah. actually being seen as full um, and womanly and beautiful as we really are, right? Yeah. I'm still looking for media where I actually feel like women are upheld as the beautiful being, black women are, as the beautiful black beings that we are. I'm so, like, I'm still looking for it, you know, like in TV and media. And I'm, I'm, and the way I see other black women is so inextricably beautiful and powerful, but not in a, like a fetishized way, right? Like, it, obviously y'all are my sisters, but I'm just thinking about when will we get to a point where we are loved on in that way, where people see us as soft and gentle and beautiful, right? And I'm just, throwing that out there. Yeah, or soft and strong. Can't you be both? Why do we have to choose? Why do I have to choose to be the strong black woman or the soft black woman? Like, I can't, can I do both? You know what I mean? Um, I, I don't, I'm with you. I think I get glimpses of it. This is what happens for me. I get glimpses of it and then I'm like, oh yeah, look at that show. It's amazing. And it's not really, it's not really amazing, but because I'm seeing a glimpse of it and I don't get to see a representation anywhere else, then I'm just like, I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, and I, I think that's, again, that's part of so much has been taken away from us that when we get a little bit of it back, that's what we use to keep going when it, it's still not 100%. When do we ever get our 100%, I guess, is, 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 is the question. Same question you have. Like, when is it going to be the, the 100%? And I wrote, I mean, I have the Alice going through that, not having the 100%, because I think it's important to, to show pain um, and to show struggle and to sh show joy at the same time, kind of what you were t we were talking about. Um, I don't think it always has to be doom and gloom, and I don't think it's always rainbows and butterflies either. That's just not real. And that's just not life, right? Life is full of pain, sorrow, joy. Um, you know, when the pendulum swings one way to grief, it'll go back way to, you know, to excitement and joy again. So we are all of those things, right? And I think we're always looking to see, I'm looking to see representations that show us black women as fully as we are. I see it for other cultures, um, but not necessarily us. I appreciated what Kelsey said. Um, their motto is tender and full of rage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. I'm all about that. Yeah, it, I definitely say Alice is, this is a rageful meditation. That's what you're going to see. You are going to see an exhibit about a rageful meditation. Um, Alice's rageful meditation. Are there any last things that you want us to know, say about Alice, about you conjuring Alice? I want you to know, it's hard for me to say, but I, I really want black women to come and see this exhibition. I always get emotional, like, this is for you. This is for you. And um, I guess I would like more. More black women to come and see that this is for you. I, I, I. I did this for you and I know it's hard and it's not exciting. It's not like <laughs> you, you probably are not going to leave like, woo, that was awesome. 
Um, but I, I think it's important. And so I would love for, for you, you black woman, first and foremost, to come and be a part of this. And then secondly, I would love for everybody else <laughs> to come and experience this exhibit. And I would also like people to write to Alice. I find that in the exhibit afterwards, because we're because of the pandemic, we can't really socialize as much. And so there's an opportunity for you to write to Alice if you want to decompress and debrief in, with her. I would love that um, as well, uh, if, you, if you wanted that opportunity. And I, the last thing I want to leave people with is my sincere gratitude um, thank you, Alicia, but for spending time with me and for having this like candid, organic conversation in front of 80 plus people. <laughs> um, I really am grateful for that. And thank you so much to the Fry um, and David, the curator, for for letting me be a Black woman in the space and fill up two big rooms with Blackness, um, because I know that's rare for a museum. And so I want to, I just want to say Thank you for that. And thank you for everyone who came out this evening. You could be somewhere else. Shout out to Reagan, whose wonderful book came out. Book launch was tonight. Um, shout out to those of you who were doing double duty and just for coming to the space. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I was telling people, I was like, when Anastasia asks you to be a part of something, you say yes, you don't, you don't hesitate. So um, this has been an honor to be a part of this conversation with you. And it was just organic and film just like we planned. Um, and I'll just end on saying um, the artist Simone Lee always says that her audience for her work is black women. And I think your audience for your work has always been black women as well. So I can see from the chat that was received, it was held, um, people love you and they're very, they feel seen that you created an exhibition um, for them. So thank you for that. Thank you. I won't get to see the chat, but I just, I'm thanking everybody. And thank you all so much for commenting. Bettina Kamari, Lebrec, everyone else for the things, Lucia, the things that you said, it's really important. So I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I guess, David, are you coming still? Yes. Um, thank you so much, Alicia and Anastasia for that conversation and the lightness and the heaviness and the vulnerability um, and the community recipe, um, all of it so much was shared and just thank you so, so much. Um, and just to reiterate, especially what Anastasia said at the end, time tickets are available through the Fry website. You can come once, you can come twice, you can come three times, come as much as you want, multiple viewings. I know, um, I think Kamari pointed this out in the chat, but just how full the exhibition is and how repeated viewings um, really make a difference. I know for me, especially reading the poems many, many times over the course of the exhibition and watching the videos many times over the course of the exhibition has really deepened just how multifaceted Alice is um, and just holding space for all that complexity, um, which you guys really touched on tonight. And also, um, write to Alice. Um, Alice is coming home at gmail.com. Um, that email is there and you can also find it through the Fry's social media. There is an Instagram post about it and you'll receive a prompt after you see the show to write to Alice, but um, please write to Alice, um, process, you know, this work, this exhibition um, and see Alice through, you know, what you can say to her. Um, so thank you, Elisheba. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, go to Winawari um, and thank you all and have such a good evening. <laughs>